in First Samuel 17, verses 1 through 7, uh, actually verses 1 through 11, we have a 9 foot, 9 inch giant standing in a valley challenging the Israelites. In First Samuel chapter 17, verse 1, now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. They gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and they camped between Soko and Azekah in Ephrath's Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah, and they drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. They're getting ready to fight. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He was nine foot nine, and he had a bronze helmet on his head. He was clothed with scale armor, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He also had bronze grieve, greaves on his legs and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. And the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. His shield carrier also walked before him. He had a man walking before him. And then he stood in verse 8, and he shouted to the ranks of Israel. He stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel. And by the way, the word stood here is Ahmad, A-M-A-D in the Hebrew. And it means to stand and to challenge, to stand against someone and to challenge them. So here's this big, loud mouth giant, nine foot, nine inches, standing and challenging the people of God. And the Bible says that he shouted, he was shouting, he stood his ground and he challenged the armies of Israel. And he said to them in 1 Samuel 17, 8, why do you come out to draw up in the battle array? Why do you come out to draw up in the battle array? Now, the word array is arak, A-R-A-K, and it means to arrange an army in rows and to be prepared to look as though you're going to fight. Now that's exactly what they, the Jews were doing. They were like many Christians, many churches. They pre look like they're prepared and they get ready to do something, but they never do it. Or they say they're going to do things, but they don't. And here are the people of God, here are the Jews, they're getting ready to fight the giant, but they never really attack. And the reason why they don't attack is because they're living in fear. They are afraid. And so they get their armies out in the front and they all look prepared and they arrange their army. They look like a fine little army. And finally the giant gets a little sick of it, Goliath, and he says, why do you keep on coming out to set up your battle, battle array? Why do you arrange your army in rows and look like you're prepared to fight? Am I not a Philistine and you servants of Saul? He says, why do you come? Why are you doing this? Why do you come? And the word yatsa here, Y-A-T-S-A, -A, is a very sarcastic uh, phrase. Why are you coming here? Am I not a Philistine? A big insult. It's like, don't you know who I am? And you are just not servants, as the, uh, the New American Standard says, but the word servants is abed, E-B-E-D, and it means slaves. You're in bondage. You see, the Jews actually had become slaves to a backslidden king whose name was Saul, and they were in bondage because they were cowards. They were afraid. And so Goliath says, now listen, choose for a man. Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. See, he's in the valley, and uh, the top of the hill, the, the, two Jewish, the Jewish army is on one side of the hill. The Philistines are on the other side of the hill, and the giant's yell, yelling in the valley and says, why don't you choose a man? Let him come down to me. And the word choose, bara, B-A-R-A-H, in the Hebrew tense, it's very sarcastic. It's why don't you choose someone? You see... Israel, the Jews, had lost the ability to make choices. They lost the ability to choose. And the reason why they lost the ability to choose is, first of all, they chose a wrong king. They chose a man who was head and shoulders above everyone else. His name was Saul. But they looked by sight. They looked by the outward appearance and not on the heart. And Israel had lost the ability to choose through backsliding and through fear.
And in backsliding and apostasy, what you choose can become very destructive. In apostasy, falling away from God and falling away from truth, people want to know what is apostasy. Apostasy simply means that you have fallen away from faith and fallen away from the faith. For instance, the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, that in the latter days, men shall depart from the faith. And the Greek word there means apostatize. They will be apostates. They will apostatize and fall away from the truth. Now, Israel had lost the ability to choose through apostasy, falling away from truth, and through fear. And in apostasy, what you choose can become very destructive. Many of the great mistakes that we make in life, in fact, most of them are made when we are not thinking in terms of divine viewpoint. And so in, po in apostasy, those that used to have battle courage, the Jews used to have battle courage, they became cowards. And Goliath does this for 40 days. After a while, these individuals just became null. You see, backsliding neutralizes courage. You can be really, really good at something and be talented in some area. And if you end up in apostasy or falling away from God, you'll, be, you'll have those things neutralized in your life. And so in verse 8, Goliath is challenging the people of God and he's saying now listen why don't you choose from among yourselves choose a man for yourselves let him come down to me and let him come down to me as you're supposed to be so great your God's supposed to be so great why don't you come on down now God has permitted this crisis to occur so that the man who is really ready in his soul will come to the surface repeat God has permitted this crisis to occur. And why has God permitted this crisis to occur? So that the man who is ready in his soul and prepared in his soul will come to the front. This is still part of the promotion of David. Only God knows what's about to happen. Now, you and I know what's going to happen because we have the completed canon of Scripture and the story is uh, written in completed form for us. But at the time, the Jews didn't know that. And 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19, the Bible even says that there must be divisions among you. Even in the local assembly, there will be divisions among you so that those who are approved may be made manifest among you. There must be factions and divisions among you in order that those who are approved may have become evident among you. And you know, every pastor will testify. Every local assembly will testify that if they've ever gone through a trial or uh, some form of division, that the ones that turned on them basically shocked them. And the ones that were faithful to them also shocked them. Sometimes we'll say, these people will never turn, and they're the first ones to turn. And other times we'll say, well, those people are weak. I don't think they'll make it. And uh, they would probably turn on us, and they become the strong ones. Well, 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen says, there must be divisions among you so that those who are approved in your local congregation will be made manifest among you. See, God permits crisis to occur in our lives, just like he did with Israel, just like he did in Corinth in 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen, just like he's doing in 1 Samuel 16, Eight with David, God has permitted the crisis to occur so that the man who is truly ready and prepared in his soul will come to the front. And of course, the man we're talking about is this man called David. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, in verse 9, Goliath says this, If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your slaves. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our slaves and serve us. You see, Goliath is emphasizing his body more than his soul. He has true strength, but he has neglected his soul. Goliath reminds me of these big, big, huge weightlifters. Oh, they've got big, big strengths in their arms. And I don't know if you've ever been into weightlifting. Nothing wrong with it. But in when the club that I go to, I watch as a lot of uh, these weightlifters, all they do is look in the mirror at themselves. And they look at their body and they look at their legs and they look at their arms and, you know, and then you go to talk to some of these and some of you ladies can testify to this and there's nothing in the soul. Now, there's nothing wrong with weightlifting. There's nothing wrong with taking care of your body. But there's something more important than your body. 
and that's your soul. Now, Goliath is emphasizing the body. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your slaves. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our slaves and serve us. Goliath is emphasizing his body more than his soul. He has true strength, but he neglected his soul. And you see, he has used his strength, not his soul, for happiness. And this kind of person is always self-destructive because all strength and no soul means absolutely no happiness. And so the Philistine Goliath made one statement that he should have never made. This is a statement that he made that actually produced his death because a man heard this statement, a real man. And so in 1 Samuel 17:10, the statement is made. Again, the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. I defy Kara, C-H-A, or Karaf. The Hebrew word is C-H-A-R-A-P-H, and it means to expose that they don't have something. In this case, it's a man. In this case, it is a man. They don't have a man. And actually, that's exactly what Goliath is saying. I defy the ranks of Israel. I'm exposing that you, the armies of Israel, don't have one man in your whole army. And you know what? There's not a man in the entire army, including the leaders and the soldiers, the military leaders, the, uh, the, the captain, etc., the officers. There's not one man who's going to take this challenge. Well, there's one man, but he's not in the army. And so this is something that's very, very important. He's able to fight with me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we'll become your servants and your slaves. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our slaves and serve us. And I defy the ranks of Israel this day. So give me a man. Actually, this is a very sarcastic phrase. Give me a man. You don't have one, but give me one that we may fight together, each other. You know, Satan loves to make Goliaths shout. What is a Goliath? Well, for many of you, a Goliath is your marriage. It is a giant of a problem. For others, a Goliath is uh, finances, a, a giant of a problem. For some, it's physical sicknesses, a giant of a problem. For others, it's uh, some major problem, some personal sin, some secret sin that they're afraid to expose, and it's hindering them, and it's the sin that does so easily beset them. For others, it's a spiritual problem, physical problem, mental problem, financial problem. But the kingdom of darkness loves to make these giants shout at us. And many of God's people are living in fear of defeat today because they don't understand how to combat the giants of life. The giants always have rain. The giants always win. The giants make them afraid. And so here is old Loudmouth himself, Goliath, shouting, defying the people of God. And there's going to come a man on the surface. And by the way, this man is not going to be a weightlifter. He's not someone who was lifting weights with Goliath in the gym. He wasn't lifting more pounds than Goliath and is going to now fight Goliath. This is a man who actually is going to, to defeat Goliath with his soul. Mental toughness is so much more important than physical toughness. And you ladies remember that if you're looking for a husband or you're looking for a man, you look for someone who is mentally tough, not physically tough. Nothing wrong with being physically tough, but mental toughness is so much more important than physical toughness. And so right here we have a man who is physically tough, and he's going to be defeated by a man who is mentally tough. Mental strength is so much greater than physical strength. And so here is this Goliath, this giant, trying to challenge the people of God. And he is going to actually regret this challenge because a real man is about to surface. Now let's look at the reaction to this challenge in verse 11. When Saul, now you have to remember that if Saul was walking down a street, you, he would be head and shoulders above everyone. Everyone would say, wow, look at that man. He was a handsome fella. He was head and shoulders above everyone. And the Bible says, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. When Saul and all Israel, all Israel simply means the Jewish army. When they heard 
the words of these of this Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Notice the words, they heard. They heard. What produced fear? Did Goliath squash anyone with his fists? Did Goliath defeat anyone as of, as of yet? No. They just heard the words of this Philistine. They were going by sight. They saw a big giant or a big problem. They were going by sight and they heard the words of this Philistine. You see, one man's words can produce fear and other man's words can produce courage. Words can produce fear in our life. And Saul and all of Israel heard those words of the Philistines. When they heard it, they were dismayed and they were greatly afraid. So please notice words pr produced fear. Notice the words they heard produced fear. The words of the Philistine, singular. One man's words, Goliath, produced fear in an entire nation. And the Bible says that when Saul and all Israel heard the words of this Philistine, these Philistines, they were dismayed. Kathat, C-H-A-T-H-A-T-H. -H -H. And you know what kathat means? It means to be a yellow belly. It means to be upset in the stomach. It means to have ulcers and butterflies. It's a person that actually is very, very nervous because of pressure. And you know the interesting thing? Now listen to me carefully. Here's the interesting thing. In 1 Samuel chapter 11, in verse 11, Saul was a great military hero. Saul was a great military soldier in 1 Samuel 11, verse 11. He was a great military hero and he knew how to, how to fight. In 1 Samuel 14, 47, Saul was outstanding in battle. So here was Saul who was once a great military hero and he was once a very, very outstanding soldier in battle and yet he's afraid. Why? He has negative volition toward the Word of God. He has fallen away from God. At one time he was great. He was in fellowship with God. But now he's a coward because he's out of fellowship. And most of David's future men who will be heroes are now afraid at this time. I want to tell you something. In the army of Israel right now, listen to me carefully because this is going to be important. In the army of Israel right now, the men are cowards. And do you realize that those same men who are cowards, the same exact men who are cowards, are someday going to be courageous heroes? You know why? Because at this time, they are following Saul. In the future, they will be following David. The same men who were cowards will someday become heroes because they were following the wrong man or as we would say following the wrong teachers now let me tell you something be very careful what kind of teaching you follow be very careful the Lord Jesus Christ spoke a parable to them and he said in Luke 6 uh, 39 he said a blind man cannot guide a blind man can he will they not both fall into a pit well listen to Luke 6 40 a pupil is not above his teacher but everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. Repeat, a pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he has fully been trained, will be like his teacher. You be very careful who you follow. And please don't give me this ridiculous thing, well, I just follow Jesus. So what does he do? Leave the throne of God in heaven at the right hand of God and come down and guide you around little Rhode Island? No, you don't follow Jesus. You follow the word of God and the gifts that God has given in the word of God. For he has given the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastor teachers and they're to communicate doctrine and truth to you. And so be very careful who you follow because if you're under a legalistic pastor, then you'll be a legalistic believer. If you're under an emotional pastor, you'll be an emotional believer. If you're under a self-righteous pastor, you'll be a self-righteous believer. If you're under a grace-oriented pastor, you'll be a grace-oriented believer. If you're under a doctrinal-oriented teacher, you'll be a doctrinal-oriented believer. So be very careful or who you follow because you are going to be influenced by these particular men no matter what you say and David has a group of men who are about to become fantastic heroes but they're the same men that are in this passage right now in first Samuel chapter 17 who are cowards what's the reason they were following the wrong man David's teaching 
David's teaching is going to produce courage and confidence in them. And they will be heroes. Ah, but Saul's teaching and Saul's uh, cowardice, well, that produced fear in them. And now they became upset and they became uh, totally, totally upset and lived in fear and did not have the ability to grow in God's grace and knowledge and therefore they were afraid. And because of that, they misrepresented the character and the nature of God. As we continue in verse 12, it says, Now David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons, and Jesse was old in the days of Saul, advanced in years among men. We begin with the phrase in 1 Samuel 17, 12, Now David. David was a man who received all types of special blessing and special affection from God. Not because God loved David more, but because David had a great capacity. And in 2 Samuel 12, verse 8, in the dying days of his life, the Lord said to David, I have given you everything, and if that wasn't enough, I would have given you more than everything. In fact, that wasn't at the dying time of his life, it was at the prime of his life. The Lord said to David, in 2 Samuel 12, 8, I have given you everything, and if that wasn't enough, I would have given you more than everything. There never was a shortage of anything in David's life. You name it, David had it. He had military he was a military leader, he had military glory, he had success, he had women, plural, make sure you understand that. Uh, not that God condones that today, but that's what God David had at the time. He had money, he had rulership, he had riches, and all of these things came from his capacity that he had from God. Now, Yesterday we tried to look at the soul, uh, the soul of Saul. In Psalm 4, we have tried to look into the soul of Goliath and uh, uh, the soul of who Goliath is. But that, there wasn't much to see. In Psalm 4, verse 1, I want to go to the book of Psalms and I want to look at the soul of David. You know, people don't understand the Psalms and they don't realize that many of the Psalms were written by David at times that he was going through certain things in certain passages. For instance, Psalm 4 is actually a psalm written by David the night before his battle with Goliath. This is what was inside of the soul of David the night before his, ba his battle with Goliath. In Psalm 4 verse 1, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Now David actually puts this in the imperative mood. He says to God, answer me. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Goliath called toward Israel. David called toward God. And while Goliath is calling toward Israel and challenging the people of God, David is calling upon the Lord. And one of the reasons why most of the men in the army of Israel were living in fear and they were afraid is because they did not call upon the Lord as David did. Goliath had strength in his body. Goliath had a lot of strength. And his strength was in his body. David's strength was much greater. David's strength was in his soul. And so, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have delivered me in my distress. Notice what David said in Psalm 4, verse 1. This is a psalm that's written the night before his fight with Goliath. He says, answer me, O Lord. Answer me, O Lord, when I call, O God of my righteousness. David knew that God is the source of his righteousness, not David. David didn't say, on the basis of my righteousness. He he said, O God of my righteousness. God is the source of David's righteousness, not David. And David's strength of character and his ability to be a hero and the ability for David to be a brave person came from the righteousness of God. Then David says, you have relieved me in my distress. The word relieved here is rakav, R-A-C-H-A-B-H. And it means to expand, to develop a capacity in David for happiness or to be caused to have a greater capacity. David is saying that in times of distress, the Lord, as the King James Bible would say, has 
enlarged me. He has expanded me. He has helped me develop a capacity to expand. When pressure was put on David, David did not back down. David was not the kind of believer that whenever there, were, there was pressure on him, he would back down and he would fall away or he'd quit on God or hide and, and uh, shut the doors and close the windows and pull down the shades and live in depression for weeks. Not David. David was a man who learned that in times of distress, you could be expanded. In times of distress, your capacity for happiness could be developed. And you see, the point is simple. When a believer becomes mature, a greater grace believer, a super grace soul has capacity. And the capacity has been enlarged for maximum blessing from God. And who gets maximum blessing from God? Well, if you're a believer, you can. But you do need one thing. You need a capacity that comes from God. Now, David said, you have relieved me in my distress. The word distress, by the way, is pressure. It means pressure. You can be like Goliath with super strength. And uh, Goliath represents all the strength of the flesh, super strength. And you can be like Goliath with super strength and ability. But without doctrine in the soul, it doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't mean a thing at all. Uh, Goliath represents everything that members of the human race would probably uh, be excited about. You know, he was big and he was tall and he was strong. And uh, he was a, a man who, according to uh, the word of God, was uh, larger than any other man in the army of the Philistines as well as uh, in the army of Israel. And he represents the strength of the flesh. And you can be a Goliath with super strength, super ability, but without doctrine in the soul it doesn't mean a thing and so David says you have relieved me in my distress you have given me capacity to handle this pressure it's his capacity for pressure that's going to cause David to handle and defeat the giant repeat it is his capacity for pressure that will cause David to handle and to defeat the giant. In fact, he faces many pressures before he even gets to the giant. Very interesting. The kingdom of darkness, Satan will do what he can to stop David from getting to the giant. You see, even, da even Satan knew that David was a man of doctrine. And if there was one thing that Satan did not want is for this man of doctrine to represent Jehovah Elohim, the Lord God, uh, before uh, the children of Israel and before uh, the Philistines. He knows that a man of doctrine can defeat any man that he has developed. And so Satan's man was Goliath. God's man was a man of doctrine. And so David said, you have given me capacity to handle this pressure. And David will face many, many more pressures before he even gets to the giant and defeats the giant. In fact, the pressures will come from his very own family. He has to fight Saul. King Saul wants him to put on his armor. And uh, King Saul is bigger than David and the armor doesn't even fit around David. The armor is so big David can't even move. And then uh, he's going to have to deal with his brother Eliab, a very jealous person, a jealous man who is very jealous of his brother. And uh, in fact, he was the most handsome in the family, Eliab. He was the one that, that uh, Samuel definitely thought should have been king because he had such a great outward appearance. And when David said, I'm going to go fight the giant, Eliab does everything in his power to discredit David and then David will have to go through the Jewish army and uh, deal with some of the hypocrisy and the gossip and the maligning and the judging and the criticism of the Jewish army this all takes place before he gets to Goliath and how is it that David can handle the pressure from King Saul the pressure from Eliab his brother and the pressure from the Jewish army it's very simple David had a capacity in his soul to handle pressure from doctrine which was resident in his soul. And so he said, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. You have taught me how to handle pressure. And then he says, be gracious to me. Be gracious to me. Keep the grace pouring 
to me and hear my prayer. Remember, this whole psalm is in the soul of David. It's the way that he thinks, and this was his attitude before the night where he was getting ready to battle against Goliath. And when a man has this type of an attitude or a woman has this type of an attitude and they're getting ready to face pressure in life or difficulty and tragedy, having a positive attitude, knowing that God is with you, being able to handle pressure, that's half of the battle right there because then you have a relaxed mental attitude and you can handle anything that the giants of life may be throwing upon you. So we're getting set up for one of the greatest victories that the children of Israel have ever seen when this man David shows the children of Israel and the army of Israel what can happen if they allow the Lord to fight for them and just trust in him with all their heart. In Psalm 4, verse 2, David said, O sons of men, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? Salah. Now I want you to think about this. David says in Psalm 4, verse 2, O sons of men. O sons of men, this phrase is actually related to the cowards in Israel's army. The men of Israel, they were cowards. O sons of men, these cowards in Israel's army, uh, how long will you will my honor become a reproach? You see, this is the apostasy that had taken place. Israel represented the honor and the glory of God. And by the way, the word honor in Psalm 4 verse 2 means glory. And David is actually prophesying through the Lord. And he says, O sons of men, how long will my glory become a reproach? Israel in Psalm 4 verse 2 was to represent the glory of God. God. And they represented the glory of God. And they had the doctrine, but they refused to hear the doctrine and become spiritual heroes. Spiritual heroes that God could have used to actually defeat Goliath and all of the Philistines. And then David said in Psalm 4 verse 2, How long will you love what is worthless? What a question. The word worthless is reek. R-I-Y-Q. And it means emptiness. And this is the condition of Goliath. Goliath is just an empty, fat-headed, overweight, big, huge giant. That's all that he is. He has no soul whatsoever. Uh, his IQ is probably as low as 70. He has no soul whatsoever. He is a big, muscular person with probably three or four words in his vocabulary. Now, this is Goliath. And so, and so David is saying, how long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? This is the condition of the giant. He is worthless. He is empty. Uh, stupid is standing out there, loud-mouthing against the children children of God and uh, no one is doing a thing about it and by the way David is actually going to say uh, not tremble and do not sin but be angry and do not sin and uh, the reason why David is going to say that because there's a legitimate time when God's people ought to get angry at those giants that are trying to discredit them and take them away from the peace of God so this is the condition of the giant he's the one that is empty as David said says, how long will you love, uh, how long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? And then he says, Salah. And remember that word Salah in the Hebrew means this. It means stop and let the musicians play. In other words, stop pause and ponder. When they sang the song and they sang these psalms, the word Salah would mean it's time for the hot player to take a solo. The word Salah means that it would be time for the trumpets to uh, uh, play the melody or take a solo as well. But Salah in the spiritual realm, when it comes to reading the word of God, means stop for a moment, don't go on to verse 3 and ponder on this. And so when he says, O you sons of men, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception this is the condition of the giant he is worthless he aims at deception 
He loves emptiness. Stupid is standing out there loud-mouthing it against God's people. And your attitude toward your giant should be the same as David's. The Jews have gone from glory to shame. They've gone from the glory of God to shame. You know why? Because they are frightened to death. They're living in fear and they are afraid of the giant. And so David says, how long will you aim at deception? And the word aim, by the way, is the uh, Hebrew word bakash, B-A-Q-A-S-H. And it means an intensive search toward deception. They were constantly trying to fake it and find excuses on why they shouldn't fight. Remember what we noted uh, last time? The children of Israel are marching. They're set up. They're ready to go out to battle. Every day they set their battle in array. Every day they set up like they're going to fight, like they're ready to attack the giant, but they never do. And they're living in, they're living in deception. They're living in lies. And that they're making off that they're going to do something, but they never do it. And that's where most Christians are at today. Most Christians give the impression that they're going to do it, that they're great believers, that they can do this, they can do that, and they set up like they're ready to attack. But when the, they're faced with the battle, they reject it. Now that's what David is talking about when he says, how long will you aim at deception? How long will you continue to try to fight and try to fake it and find excuses why you shouldn't fight? And excuse Excuses are really lies many times. That's all they are. They're nothing more but lies. A lot of times people don't like to admit what the truth is. Uh, a person might be having a bad day or make a series of negative decisions and the next thing you know they'll say, oh the reason why I did that I was tired or I was sick or uh, I, I had a bad day because you see uh, I didn't feel good and they'll try to blame the sickness or they'll try to blame something else on their bad day and they look for excuses rather than saying, well because I have a sin nature and the sin nature nature came to the surface and I let it get the best of me and I'll try not to let it happen again. And until you do that, until you stop blaming uh, some disease or some of you ladies blame your monthly visitation or some men blame the way things are working out on the job, until you stop blaming people and blaming things, you're never ever going to be able to solve the problem. And that's what David is saying. And then he says, Salah. Relax, let the orchestra play, and it refers to stop working and let God do it. When you see that word Salah, I want you to think of the phrase, stop working and let God do it. In Psalm 4, verse 3, David goes on with his great description and his courage of letting us know exactly what type of attitude men of God, women of God should have when they're faced with trials and difficulties. David said, but know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. What a statement from a man with confidence. Know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Now that's what you call confidence. David first of all says, I want you to know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. And then he says, and the Lord will hear when I call to him. Insinuating the fact that David knows he's a mature believer and that he loves God and that God is going to come through. That's what we call spiritual self-esteem. See, some people would say, now, now, David, pride cometh before the fall. Don't be appear, try to appear that you're something and God likes you better than others. You see, right away, the arrogant believer would rather have David on the be bed saying, uh, oh, praise the Lord. Oh, Jesus, I'm nothing. Oh, help me and save me. I'll never make it. Oh, shucks, I'm just a weak little person. Perhaps maybe God will deliver me. And people say, that's humility. No. Humility is when you can make an accurate statement according to truth and integrity and know that God gets all the glory and God has done all the work, but man can receive the confidence. And so David says, know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself and the Lord hears when I call to him and has set apart pala p-a-l-a-h in the Hebrew tense the Lord has caused the super grace mature believer to be set apart see David is different than everyone else in Israel he's a super grace believer loaded with doctrine and he has been set apart 
And David says, the Lord has set apart for himself the one that is godly, the super grace hero. And the Lord will hear when I call to him. Here is true confidence. Goliath's confidence was in self. David's confidence was in doctrine. Goliath is calling unto Israel. David is calling unto God. In Psalm 4, verse 4, the New American Standard says, Tremble and do not sin. The King James Bible says, Stand in awe and be, uh, do not sin. And literally, the word here for tremble is ragaz, R-A-G-A-Z, and it means be violently angry. Now, this describes David the moment he hears old loudmouth in the valley. He gets angry. Now, tonight, we will be communicating and teaching here uh, at the East Bay Christian Center on the doctrine of anger, another doctrine that is vital to dating, relationship, and marriage. And literally, this verse is saying, be angry and sin not. Now, David was angry because Goliath was defying the living God and his armies. In fact, this is another psalm that also applies to Absalom and David. And David was angry because Goliath here was defying the living God and his armies. Old loudmouth is flexing his muscles. And the Jewish army was the army of the Lord of hosts. Jesus was their, the Lord Jesus Christ, Jehovah Elohim, was their chief commander. So Goliath was actually insulting the Lord. And usually that's what our giants do. The giants in our lives, whatever they may be, financial problems or physical problems, uh, it can be anything. The giants in our life usually, uh, they, they defy and insult the Lord. And how do giants in our lives defy and insult the Lord? Well, when we let them have the be their way, when we let them get the best of us. And so David was angry because Goliath was defying the living God and his armies. And so the Jewish army, the army of the Lord of hosts, the Lord Jesus Christ as their chief commander, should have accepted the battle. So Goliath was insulted the Lord and that's what our problems our difficulties are, do when we allow them to do so when we freak out and fall apart because of the way things are going and uh, the Bible teaches in 1st Samuel 17 26 that the children of Israel were the armies of the living God so this was anger without sin in Psalm 4, verse 4, uh, uh, be angry and do not sin. This was anger without sin. Now, most anger ends up in sin, but this is an anger uh, against uh, someone defying the Lord Jesus Christ. So in Psalm 4, verse 4, it says, be angry and do not sin. And then it says, meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. This means to think with what is inside of your heart. Well, what's in David's heart? Doctrine. What's in Goliath's heart? Arrogance. What's in David's heart? The Word of God. And so he says, tremble and do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still, Salah. And you see, when David hears loudmouth coming against him with their challenge, he says, think. He says, think, loudmouth Goliath and the Philistines are going to come against the children of Israel with their challenge. And David says, here's what we need to do. We need to meditate in our hearts upon our bed and be still. And upon our bed means simply that David wrote this the night before the battle. He got a good night's sleep before the battle and after the battle. The only thing in 1 Samuel 17, 54, the night before that did the battle David slept alone the next night David slept with someone well actually the night after the battle he slept with the head of old Goliath so David is now writing this now without someone in his tent later on he will have someone in his tent the head of the giant old loudmouth didn't do much talking that night uh, he is now dead and so in Psalm 4 verse 4 David is actually saying think meditate on what is inside of your heart your right lobe upon what's inside of your heart, your bed, and be still. And the word be still, domain, D-A-M-A-N, simply means keep quiet, button your lip. You see, David will be criticized by his older brother, uh, Eliab. His older brother will say, where's your sheep, David? But the mature believer has stability in his soul. 
He's not intimidated by the uh, haughty ha ha's of life or the Archie Bunkers. And on way to fighting the giants, don't waste your time with fighting others. Don't let people sidetrack you from your calling in the Christian way of life. There will be a lot of obstacles and a lot of distractions and a lot of people who will be sent to try to sidetrack you from your calling. And on way to fighting the giants of life and, and glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ, do not get sidetracked with hindrances and so the word salah here simply means quit singing and let the orchestra play and that's just what they'll do that's just what David do he quit singing he quit singing and he's gonna let the orchestra play but in reality he's resting and he's waiting on God in Psalm 4 verse 5 offer the sacrifices of righteousness Take in the word of God daily. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness. Put your trust in the Lord, he says. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness. The sacrifices of righteousness. Buy the truth. Sell it not. Sacrifice your time. Hey, take in the word of God. And David says, and trust in the Lord. Batak, B-A-T-A-C-H. It speaks of the faith rest life. And this comes from hearing the word of God. And David says in verse 6, many are saying who will show us any good? David says, many are saying, who will show us any good? There will always be all kinds of people when there's pressure who, who have all kinds of ideas on how to whip the giants. Many will say things. And David said, many will say, who will show us any good? Many soldiers in Israel were complaining about the giant. And they uh, were yelling about the giant. They were murmuring and complaining. They were uh, disobeying in the New Testament what we would call Philippians 2.14. Do all things w without murmuring and complaining. So there's always people that will complain. There's always people that will say things against you. There's always people that will try to get in your, uh, your way. And David is saying, while all this is going on, many are saying, who will show us any good? And uh, who will show us any good? And show us good actually here is ra'ar, R-A-A-H, and it means to cause us to see good. In other words, can anyone handle old loudmouth? They could have, but they were afraid. You see, the children of Israel could have handled the giant, but they were afraid. They would have had a nervous breakdown at this time because fear has now come into their lives. And because fear has now come into their lives, they've got some incredible problems. And so David says, many are saying, who will show us any good? Who will show us any good? They could have, but they were afraid. And then they said, lift up the light of thy countenance upon us, O Lord. And that's one of the secrets as we're going to see. The light of thy countenance of God being lifted up. But David tells us the secret to su success in Psalm 4, verse 7. David says, you have put gladness in my heart, my right lobe, my brain. You have put your happiness and your gladness in my heart. And uh, hast put, he already has been giving, past tense. Gladness is the, is the Hebrew word simcha, S-I-M-C-H-A-H, and it means the perfect happiness of God. So we have verse 7, you have put happiness in my heart. This is the testimony of the mature believer, the believer who is not afraid of the giants of life, the believer who is not afraid to go against the herd, the believer who's not afraid to stand up for what they believe. And remember, this, is the, this psalm is in the soul of David. It's the way that he thinks. While old loudmouth is flexing his muscles, David is doing much more than that. David is revealing the character and the nature of God to the angels, even as the angels are observing, even as David gets ready to glorify God. And with this inner happiness, he says, you have put gladness in my heart more than when the grain and the new wine abound. The inner happiness is better than the prosperity that comes from uh, outwardly glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. This is in the soul of David. This is why David could defeat the giant. David had doctrine resident in his soul and therefore he was prepared for the battle. In Psalm 4 verse 8 it brings out the security that takes place in the night seasons. Some say this psalm was written uh, for David's situation with Goliath. Others say it was written for David's situation with Absalom. No matter wh when it was written, it was written for a difficult time in the life of David. And so in Psalm 4 verse 8, he says, In peace I will both lie down to sleep, 
F, and for you alone, O Lord, you make me to dwell in safety. In peace, shalom, S-H-A-L-O-M, means prosperity, peace, and welfare. I will both lie down and sleep. Hebrew 10 says, at once I will sleep. For you alone, Lord, do make me to dwell in safety. You alone, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the only true celebrity. He's the only one on David's mind. David is occupied with Christ. You make me to dwell in safety. This is the soul of the mature believer the night before the battle. The night before the battle. So in Psalm 4, verse 8, sleep is used for a manifestation of faith rest. It is used for David's faith rest. I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to sleep now. I'm not going to worry about the battle tomorrow. I'm going to face that giant, and I'm going to face that problem tomorrow head on. And in prosperity and peace, I'm going to lie down and go to sleep. Prosperity is related to sleep in the Psalms and in the book of Proverbs. For instance, in Psalm 127, 1 and 2, prosperity is related to sleep. The Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. And it is vain, it is a vain thing for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of hard work. Now listen to this. For he gives to his beloved, the mature believer, even his sleep. For the mature believer, he enjoys sleep, even though he has problems. And you know, the Bible makes it crystal clear that if we have doctrine in our soul, and we really do believe what we claim to believe, that our sleep will be sweet. The Bible tells us to keep sound wisdom and discretion, and do not let sound wisdom depart from our sight. Proverbs 3, 21. And then in Proverbs 3, 22, so they will be life to your soul, an adornment to your neck. Then you will walk in your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. Now listen to this. When you have doctrine resident in the soul, when you lie down, you will not be afraid. We're talking about being afraid of your giants. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. And when you lie down, Proverbs 3.24 says, your sleep will be sweet. Your sleep will be sweet. And so he says, do not be afraid of any sudden fear in Proverbs 3.25. So for the mature believer and the believer who loves God and has doctrine resident in the soul, for that particular believer, their sleep, their sleep will be sweet because they will be trusting in God and they will not be tossing and turning all night. Proverbs 6.22 tells us the same principle. It says, when you walk about, doctrine will guide you. And when you sleep, doctrine will watch over you you see prosperity blessing is related to sleep in the Bible and so meant uh, when we see the word sleep in Proverbs 4 we're dealing with the faith rest that David had the night before the battle now sleep can also be uh, related to some negative things such as in Proverbs 416 evil men are related to sleep in Proverbs 4 verse 16 the Bible says for they cannot sleep unless they do evil and there are some people that they are robbed of sleep unless they make someone stumble they're involved with wickedness but sleep is also related to divine protection in Psalm 3 5 and 6 the Bible says in Psalm 3 verse 5 or for the I mean Psalm 3 verse 5 I will lay down in sleep I awoke for the Lord sustains me I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about why why could David sleep because of divine protection sleep is also used as an analogy to laziness and lack of proper motivation in Proverbs 6 4 through 11 and uh, Proverbs 10 5 and Proverbs 19 15 in Proverbs 6 4 through 11 we see how sleep is related to uh, laziness and lack of motivation the Bible says do not give sleep to your eyes nor slumber to your eyelids deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hunter's hand and like a bird from the hand of the fowler go to the ant you sluggard observe her ways be wise which having no chief officer or ruler the ant prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest how long will you lie down O lazy one when will you arise from your sleep 
a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and your poverty will become will come in like a vagabond, and your need like an armed man. You see, sleep is related to uh, losing and laziness and lack of motivation. Proverbs 20:15. Don't love sleep, lest you become poor. Proverbs 20, and this refers to a person who'd rather be on welfare and do nothing than go out and find a job, by the way. That would be our application to our current uh, day that we live in. In Ecclesiastes 5.12, sleep is also used as an analogy to the conscience. Sleep is used for a capacity for life. The full stomach is used for lack of capacity. It says in Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter, and the twelfth verse, and remember this goes along with where a lot, why a lot of people do not enjoy rest. The sleep of the working man is pleasant, and whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. Sleep is used as an analogy to the conscience. Sleep is used for capacity for life. The sleep of the working man, well, it's pleasant. But, it says, but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. And the full stomach is used for lack of capacity. The, work, the working man is tired and has character and integrity, and therefore he enjoys his sleep. The rich man worries about what's going to happen. Now, it's so important that we understand some of these principles and how the Bible uses these things because they give us an, a, a, a tremendous uh, insight into what's really going on. And I love the fact that David uses sleep in this particular passage because it means that David is going to wait upon the Lord. It means that David is just sitting back and he's going to wait upon the Lord and wait for his guidance and wait for the direction that he needs. And this is what he needed in, in 1 Samuel chapter 17. When we get back to that passage, we will see exactly what he needed. So in Psalm 4, David says, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. You have given me an enlargement in times of pressure. You have enlarged my soul. Be gracious gracious to me and hear my prayer and then he's insulting the children of Israel who are allowing people to walk all over them you sons of men how long are you going to turn God's glory into a reproach how long are you going to love what is worthless and aim at deception but know that the Lord has set apart the mature believer the godly man the godly woman for himself the Lord hears when I call to him so be angry and sin not says David meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still Salah offer up the sacrifices of righteousness trust in the Lord there are many are saying who's going to show us any good these are the cowards on the on the battle line who are setting up to battle but won't take the challenge lift up the light of your countenance upon us O Lord you have put gladness in my heart notice David didn't say you have put gladness in their heart he says you have put gladness happiness in my heart more than when the grain and the new wine abound in peace I will both lie down and sleep for you are alone O oh Lord you make me to dwell in safety David knew that his safety came from his relationship with the Lord and you remember that the next time you're faced with a problem you're faced with a difficulty you have a giant in your life the giant of materialism trying to get the best of you or the giant of financial problems or the giant of a marital problem or the giant of a personal problem that you just do not want to share with others or, or the giant of a physical problem you might be dying or you might be living in fear that you have some type of disease and you're on your way out. Well, that may be true and it may not be true. But the fact of the matter is this, that no matter what you're faced with in life, no matter what kind of problem it is, be it physical, mental, spiritual, whatever it may be, you remember this principle, that God is the one who can give you that sleep and that rest and that trust and that the Lord is the one who can give you the ability to overcome the giants of life and in this world we are faced with giants we are faced with all kinds of difficulties all kinds of problems the God of this world Satan himself will do his best to try to cause us to live in fear and to be sidetracked to be distracted to live in doubt to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine this is something that the kingdom of doctrine 
darkness will do constantly so that believers never ever get solid with their doctrine. They're tossed to and fro. They go from church to church. They hop from place to place until they find what they call the perfect place, but it never happens. And they get involved with all kinds of things that have nothing to do with the Christian way of life. Well, if your soul is filled with doctrine and if you have proper motivation and if you understand what the Christian way of life is all about, your attitude will be like David's. That no matter what type of problem or difficulty or pressure comes upon you, God is the one who will give you the ability to say as David said, and as we will see when we get back to 1 Samuel 17 in verse 47, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give the giant into your hands. And my friends, that is exactly true. The battle is the Lord's. It belongs to God. You rest and relax and let God work through you. The battle is the Lord's and 